So, hello, my name is Simon Thornett. I'm a senior software developer at Catalyst. Um, I'm here today to talk to you all about an open source plugin that we've been working on uh, that will hopefully help many of you here plus the wider community. Uh, and that plugin is the data import tool. Now, over the course of this presentation, um, I'm going to try and cover a few different things. Um, what the plugin is uh, and how it works, the problems that we try and aim to hope solve with it, uh, how it's been developed, uh, the approach that we decided to take in this instance, and hopefully how that can benefit everyone here, uh, even if the vanilla solution doesn't quite meet your requirements. And finally, the Q&A session at the end. Uh, so, first off, uh, what is it and how does it work? So, you'll have to excuse me reading my script constantly. Uh, the data import tool is a plugin um, that will enable you to connect your Moodle to an any, sorry will enable you to connect your Moodle to an external data source and automatically keep categories, cohorts, courses users and users' enrollments synced up um, and up to date. Um, you'll understand more about how this works as we step through the plugin and the various settings. Um, and then how we actually manage this is via the settings interface, which I'm going to bring up now. That is a horrible resolution. I am so sorry. This looked great on my laptop. Damn. Right, one minute. OK, so just imagine you can actually read that, and I'll step through it. Um, so here, you can see the general tab. That's what the first word actually says. Uh, this tab contains the global configuration and connection settings. Um, you'll hopefully see at the top uh, global connections. So this allows you to enable and define the settings for external connections to a database, um, a local file, or an SFTP file. They are there, I promise. Um, and this will determine the shared setting that each import task will be able, each import task will be able to use. Um, again, you're going to see that on the next screen in a little bit. Um, at the bottom, we actually have the log settings. Um, so here you can define the types of import logs you want to store, whether it's just successful logs, error logs, um, or whether, yeah, whether you want everything or custom. And finally, at the bottom there, um, you can define a list of email addresses of people who will be notified with... Yeah, any... I thought it was like a theater. Am I being flagged off to get off the stage? <laughs> no? Is there a hook? No? Okay. Um, so, yeah, uh, where was I? Emails. Yeah, so basically you can define a comma-separated list of emails of people who are going to be notified at the end of the scheduled task of basically how messed up it was. Any errors, any problems, warnings, and so on. So let's have a look at the course tab. Um, oh, that's even worse. Right. It was a really big page, so I split it into three screens. So just, it's like a magic eye thing. Just squint, and you'll be able to read it. Um, so starting with the left image, you'll see that we have the option to enable the task. Pretty self-explanatory. Uh, we also have the schedule. Uh, this uses the same Unix cron format that you would have seen in the schedule tasks in the rest of your system. Uh, and it allows for individual customization of each of the tasks. Now, again, right at the very top, you'll see that there are the different tabs. So category, uh, cohort, course, user, and user enrollment. I'm only going to go through the user one in this level. And you'll kind of see why on the next screen in a minute. Um, now, this is where, under the connections, you'll see where the global connections that we were just talking about on the previous screen get used. So within each of the tasks, you have the option to choose whether or not you want to use the global connection that you've just defined. So you can have all of your tasks picking up all of their data from the same place for consistency. Uh, or alternatively, you can define at each task level where you want each individual set of data coming from. So your courses could come from an external database. Your users could come in through uh, CSV files that's being exported from your user management system. Um, the, it's completely configurable, however you want to use it. Um, uh, 
Uh, under so under all the connection settings, onto the middle screen, uh, we have the general settings. Uh, for courses, we have the options of what we're going to do with the external, if the external course has been removed. So in this instance, we've got hide selected, so you can hide it, delete it, or do nothing with it. The task itself actually defines this, so uh, you could choose to back it up, you could choose to reset it, you could extend this and make those modifications however you want. Um, and underneath that, just a Boolean flag just to say whether or not we actually want to keep the courses updated. Do you just want to pull in the courses once and then forget about them? Or do you want to constantly keep courses, users, and everything in sync with the external system? Uh, finally, we've got the mappings. So we've got the, in the middle at the bottom, you've got local mappings and then remote mappings up here. Uh, local mappings tell us what field the remote data will use to determine the linked to Moodle. So in the case of courses, we need to know both the category field and course field. That is there. Um, uh, the remote mappings let us know what column in your data maps to the local field within the system. So you don't need to worry about restructuring or reformatting your data. Um, we can just pick it up and modify it and handle the transformation at the task level. Uh, okay, so now, with the exception of the mappings, which are obviously really specific to each area of the system, um, I haven't got screenshots for all of those. Um, the main difference between all of them is the import task settings, import task settings, which you can see here. So we've got the category, I can read that. The category, the cohort, the course, the user, and the user enrollments. Uh, category has the most complex one, um, simply because it isn't just the category. It obviously contains all the, co contains all the courses and everything. Uh, so here you can actually specify the action that you want to take against those courses. So if the category gets deleted, uh, you can then choose what you want to do with the course. You can move it somewhere else, you can hide them, and uh, so on. Uh, similar kind of functionality to what the course one has. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Okay, so uh, cohorts and courses uh, can choose to be deleted or hidden. Uh, users can obviously be deleted or suspended. Uh, user enrollments, uh, you can unenroll the user. Uh, with all of these, you have the option to do nothing. If the data disappears off your remote system, if you don't want it to, you can just leave it on the LMS. You don't have to delete everything out of the system, but the idea is to give you the configuration, the choices to how you want to configure this and how you want to use it. Okay, so why did we create this? Um, we created this in conjunction with a few of our different partners. Uh, a lot of them were having the same problem of their user management systems and so on. They wanted to get data, share data between things. Um, so we started having a lot of discussions and trying to work out if we could build a singular solution that would meet everyone's requirements. No, you can't do that. So what instead we tried to do was to create this plugin that was completely configurable, but importantly, it is fully extendable, um, which we're going to get to in a second. Um, we did talk, obviously, about trying to use as much of the core functionality as possible in terms of the front-end interfaces, but they can be scattered across the system. Some of them don't enable automation. And if anyone here has tried to do that, obviously, it can be quite a time-consuming and complex task to actually try and integrate into the system, and also tends to break with upgrades as well. So our hope was to remove some of the stresses when dealing with data imports by using this plugin, and it interacts directly with the core functionality of Moodles. Um, now, to get on what I, to what I was just alluding to about how it's been actually been developed, during the presentation, I've referred to this data import tool as a plugin, which isn't, which isn't actually accurate. It's 13. Um, or more precisely, it's actually one plugin. Oops, skip that part. It's actually one plugin and then 13 sub, 12 sub plugins, um, which are structured like so. So everything from the settings, the connections, and the import types 
are their own sub plugins that define the logic, the form settings. Um, they all, as you'll see, have a base sub plugin. And this handles most of the heavy lifting. So all of those forms that you saw on the previous page are just an array of information. Uh, it's all passed through and generated to each of the base plugins to handle all of that. Um, so the main plugin actually operates more as a framework for loading these, um, these particular sub-plugins, the settings, connections, and import types. Um, and obviously, the reason that we chose to go with this is for extendability and customization. What may work for your average person or may work for one person, one client, isn't necessarily going to work for any of you. In fact, the chances are of a vanilla plugin working out the box for everything is probably going to be quite slim. You can use it for a good amount of things, but for everything, you'll, you'll want to be able to customize and extend it. And that was why we went for with this. And uh, what I'll do is I'll give you an example of how this could work, my, fa my favorite one. So say you have a HR system, and it's exporting a user, C user CSV file onto the Moodle server um, for you to load it in with a local file connection. Now, obviously, being security conscious, you want to have the file encrypted. Now, by default, the local file connection isn't going to be able to handle the decryption side of things. Uh, it doesn't have an area to put in the decryption key or anything like that. However, with the sub plugin framework, you can actually create the new connection sub plugin that handles this with about 25 lines of code. So, so by creating a new sub plugin that extends the existing file sub plugin, you just need the few lines of code to add the settings. So the ones that you saw on the course page, um, all of those settings down in the center, you would obviously want to add in, say, something like a password field with a decryption key that you'd want to use. And then you just need a few lines of code within the actual process itself to handle the decryption before it gets passed back to the vanilla, to the vanilla local file plugin. So you're just handling the decryption, not actually worrying about any of the process. You give that to the parent and make the setting changes, pass it back to the parent, and it loads it and it loads it into the system. It should be relatively straightforward. Um, something that originally could have taken ta days of development work to do is down to a matter of hours. And obviously, that's not including testing, deployment, and everything else. But you know, for the most part, it's a relatively straightforward process because we have the framework, we have the sub-plugins, and you can build upon them. Um, and it's not just limited to those five tabs that you saw. If you wanted to load in grade information, again, we could, you could have a grade, uh, grade sub plugin type and anything. Um, everything is handled by the framework in that regard. So um, you could create new collection, connection plugins. So you could load it from an external web service. That's something I've been asked a few times. Uh, can we load uh, user data or course data in for, from our web service? Well, yep. You just need to create a new connection sub plugin that handles that. You define the settings, and it all builds in with the actual framework to run the request regularly and pull all of that information in. One of the reasons we focused on this approach was to reduce the need to modify core code. Modifying core code, whilst seems easier and can usually be quite minor, um, can have lasting and far-reaching implications, as I'm sure many of you are probably aware if you've had to do anything like that. So, for starters, you're no longer on the maintained version, which means that updates, security releases, bug fix, and everything can't just be pulled in as they are. So instead of using a vanilla plugin and then making the modifications so that it suits your requirements, by using something like this and by using the sub plugin approach, you oh, too early. By using the sub plugin approach, you don't need to. You can keep the vanilla plugin as a core instance that is updated and maintained for you. And then it's just your small sub plugins that you need to be aware of when it comes to doing upgrades and anything's coming in. And with a lot of the heavy lifting being handled by the framework, 
it should be relatively minor in terms of the work that you actually have to do to keep these in step with each other. I think that's about it. Um, oh, so before uh, Q&A, yeah, I, I know, I, I know, I panicked. Um, so <laughs> I'm a developer. I don't, I don't do talking very well. Um, so it's time for the Q, a bit, well, before we get to the QA, I want to preemptively answer the first question that I get, which is, um, where is it? I want it. Uh, where can I have it? Where can I look at it? Where can I pick it apart? So on the screen now, you're going to see a link to the Catalyst repo where the plugin will be housed, in quotes. Um, the aim was to try and have a beta release all ready for this. I'm going to step aside. Uh, have a beta release all ready for this for this week. Um, unfortunately, due to various different reasons, that didn't happen. We're still in the alpha and going through some of the local testing within our actual development team. Um, but you will see that there are a couple of discussions on there. There's the beta release discussion and the full release discussion. What I would ask you to do is that if you are interested in this and you do want to be a guinea pig and run some testing as well, um, please go and subscribe to the discussion. And I will be posting updates on there with regards to actual release schedules and release plans. I am sorry that we don't actually have the final code, but I didn't want to push up what I have got. And it, yeah, no one wants to push up half-finished stuff. So yeah, those are the discussions. And um, yeah, that's everything. Any questions? Can I make a recommendation? And next time, can someone move this under the AC? It's boiling up here. <laughs> Do we have any questions for Simon? Oh, sorry, I one. Um, sounds very, very interesting. Um, I was wondering if it's also available for workplace or it's currently only aimed at core? It's it's currently only been developed for Moodle. Um, that doesn't mean it won't work with Workplace. Um, it's certainly something that we can have a look at. Um, if it does require any modifications to it to make it work specifically with Workplace, then we would probably fork off of this in a separate repo. Um, but there's no reason why it couldn't. Um, from what, what I'm aware of in terms of how it functions and how we've designed it, um, but certainly something that we can have a look at. Um, I'll actually make an Sam, can you make a note of that? Check workplace. Thank you. I've left my notebook at the table. Any more? Hi there. Uh, one question that I have is, um, are you trying to aim to replace the already existing external database enrollment that is already um, present in Moodle core? Um, because I feel like 30% or so of the functionality is kind of covered by this. However, having used that functionality, I know it's kind of difficult to get it up and running. And your um, approach seemed to be like way more usable, let's put it this way. And uh, so that's where, I'm, where my question is coming from. No, I can appreciate where you're coming from. Um, the thing is, is that the, the issue that we had with it, and certainly with the discussions that we were having, was the problem was in the name, is that it's database only. Obviously, you've got the external database that you can use for things like the user enrollments, which runs in and picks up on sync. When the user tries to log in, it will go through and do those bits. We found it quite difficult to do it preemptively as well, when people want to report on things before the users even access the course as to who's on the course, um, but also trying to bundle it all in one package so that you only have to go to one place to deal with things. And also, whilst you have the external database tool, if you wanted to put something in there where you want to load in, say, grades or something else from somewhere, something custom, the option to extend and add all of those things is difficult to actually do and to maintain that going forward. So it was just as a way to try and give everyone one place to go, kind of a one size fits all most solution, um, and then add the customizations in from there. I appreciate that. So, um, if I understand it correctly, it currently does not have the um, like the functionality that the external database authentication, because it's two different things actually, has where if a user is present in an external database and logs on to Moodle, um, the tool can check if that user is present in the external database and then migrates it over to Moodle. Is that something that your tool is going to cover 
as well, or is that planned? Or? Not at the moment, but okay. that actually ties into triggers and events, which is kind of a phase two thing that we've been looking at. Obviously, we've got the schedule, as you saw, with the schedule task and being able to define the frequency for something like that. You could run it every cron run if you wanted to. Um, but one of the other things that we have been discussing is triggers and events, such as course created, course updated, um, and user login events, for example, being able to select from them and choose to pull information around. That sounds super interesting. Awesome. Thank you very much. Cool. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much as well. I was wondering, maybe you could point out. Where am I looking? Maybe you Over could there. point Hello. out for, for short. Um, what's about it? Is there any kind of documentation how to write submodels for this? And whether in the future there might be breaking changes, how do you have plans, how to communicate them? and. Okay, so most of the communications that we're going to be doing will be through the actual GitHub in terms of any announcements and releases and bits and pieces. Um, backwards compatibility for any major changes and major breakages. Um, I'm a big fan of actually going through a deprecation cycle of keeping things in a deprecated stage so we ended up with both and then slowly phase that out to give everyone a chance to go through and make those corrections. Um, with regards to the actual documentation for the sub-plugins, um, we have templates for the sub-plugins. They are incredibly lightweight. Um, as I said, the actual building that whole settings page um, for the course, for example, is only about, I think, 80 lines of code, and most of that is just an array of information and language strings. The heavy lifting is mostly done by the base plugin, um, but we will be providing documentations and templates as well. Um, and obviously, more than happy to have questions and feedback and anything slung at me on the, on the discussion. Um, yeah, so I, I hope that helps. <laughs>